I'm William O. Young. I'm here with the Vibrant Performance PZ Tuning Time Attack Civic. This car started life actually as a 2012 Honda Civic Si. Was basically stripped out and turned into a full out Time Attack car. We started the build in this in 2015 actually. We were at our first event with it in four months time in May at Global Time Attack Road Atlanta. We happened to win our class, uh, the Unlimited Front Wheel Drive class. It was the beginnings of what would be a never ending process of developing and making it faster and challenging ourselves and pushing the boundaries with the goal of making it truly as fast as we possibly could. You know, we come back to get the car back to Canada and right off the bat, we're prepping for Pikes Peak, 97th running of Pikes Peak. Lots of focus on cooling, lots of focus on the tuning required for the altitude. So we had Sasha at On Point Dyno out and we learned a lot about the car. We learned a lot about the tuning. Sasha had a lot of adjustments to make because the altitude, you know, starting at 10,000 feet, ending at 14,000 feet, definitely is a different dynamic than what we're, we've ever tuned the car with. That was a pretty incredible experience though because it's the first time you set foot in Colorado at Pikes Peak. You just don't realize just how ridiculous an expanse Pikes Peak is several times <laughs> more magnificent and more crazy than you what you were expecting. Definitely, like I said, getting there, getting the tire test, we learned a lot of lessons. A lot of lessons even about ourselves and waking up at 2.30 in the morning, getting to the track and prepping early. The most surprising thing is, is how much the elevation affects you as a person. When you realize that, you also realize how much the altitude affects the car. But it's not until you look at your data and you see your temperatures just climbing and never stopping in terms of climbing that you realize as much as we've taken every preparation and putting a larger Ron Davis rad, putting a larger tract of swirl pot in there, upgrading all our lines to 20 and vibrant lines, no, temperature's still going to be an issue. We come back to Canada, obviously Sasha's doing his tuning stuff. 
we're doing a little bit more cooling, just doing all the duct work we can to make sure that all the air is getting through the rat and getting through the intercooler. Getting a wrap done, having Art come by and finish up the wrap outside in the parking lot so we can finish our Tim Hortons shoot the, the day before packing up to leave to Pikes Peak for race week. Compared to any other time attack, whether it was going to World Time Attack in Australia or going to Japan for Scuba Time Attack, the gearing is different, the cooling is definitely different, the fuel system is a higher capacity than normal. So we get through very first day, we're doing Upper Mountain. It's the first time we're racing to the summit of Pikes Peak and sure enough, right off the bat, you know, our cooling system's boiling and going through into our overflow. We weren't quite sure what it was at this point in time and moment. Instead of risking breaking something, we're like, you know what, we're gonna cut it off at two runs, done what we need. We have data to come back and we definitely learned a lot about the upper section where there's different bumps and there's areas where you really have to avoid and be smart about. So we come back down and I send Sasha our data and he's reviewing it. He's doing his adjustments to the ECU. So we get to qualifying day, second day of practice for us. Driver briefing at 4.30 in the morning. As a rookie, you have to do each section one time. That was one thing before they'll let you race the event. That was our thing was we wanted to make sure we put a banker in. So first session, all I did was go out there, roll on the throttle, lowest boost possible and get through that sector. I'm driving probably nine out of 10. Felt really good in that sector. Car's doing great, brakes are feeling awesome, tires are working amazing. And we get to about the halfway point of qualifying, bam, I lose my power steering. I've never driven this car without power steering ever in my life. Total shock of the moment of, wow, like the effort went from effortless to trying to use all my muscles in my arms just to turn this thing through a hairpin. I remember that, you know, Cole Duran was saying, you got to put down a really good time for qualifying because you don't quite know how the weather is going to become race day and you want to qualify as well as you can to be up at a qualifying spot. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to drive the rest of this as hard as and as fast as I can. We managed to put down a pretty good qualifying time. And so it's a factory OEM Honda EPS system. It's an electric uh, motor assist on it. We're here, we're thinking like, it's probably a cooling related issue because one of the Acura guys did tell us that these systems do have a tendency to overheat with too much input. That night we were focused on improving cooling to our EPS controller, adding ducting to the actual rack itself. We spent that night actually incorporating a duct right here and putting this duct work right into the motor assembly. And then we put a fan on the EPS controller, thinking that that's probably what it was, you know, two minutes into the run, driving harder than I've ever driven. That makes sense. You know, it's just overheating. It's over torquing at that point. So we get into the third practice day, which is middle mountain. I felt pretty good at this during the tire test day. So in my mind here, I'm, you know what, I'm going to try pretty hard here and just try and really get the best sector time we possibly could. Sure enough, as I'm entering the very first morning practice, the power steering stops working again. So I'm like, I'm just gonna drive this as fast as I possibly can without the power steering. We were able to isolate the issue seemingly into either a wiring issue or the actual EPS controller itself. We're wiggling the wires and it would cut in and out the steering. So we take the power steering out, the controller out, I solder whatever connections I possibly can see and we put it back in and voila, our power steering starts it's working again. And we took the last two runs of the day with our power steering enabled. I just you know, decide to push. It's like, you know, this is this is it. The car's working good right now. And I was driving hard and pushing the engine oil temp really start climbing at this point in time. So we get back down to the bottom, get back down to base, to, to our Airbnb, which happened to be also be our shop. We're trying to figure out all that's needed to obviously get to the last practice day. Lots of lessons learned, changing our cooling system, to our coolant in our cooling system. Art doing the midnight run to go pick up some extra coolant because we were a little bit shy. And then we get to the last practice day. The car's working great. I'm feeling good. I decide we're gonna skip the first session and we're gonna run the second session. But we're gonna run the second session as if it was a race start. So I'm gonna get to the line. I'm gonna be ready. We're gonna roll off the line as if it was a hot track. And I wanted to do this because I've never ever done an, an event like Pikes Peak where you start off the day with basically zero laps under your belt. There's two things I learned about that. It takes a lot to be able to get yourself to go at full speed when you haven't done that yet in the day. It was actually very, very difficult to have the confidence to just go into a corner and trust that the grip was there, trust that everything else was there when you're not in a rhythm yet, when your heart rate's not up yet. Anyway, so I get to about 
two thirds of the way and I noticed that oil temp was getting really, really hot at this point in time. My warning light actually came on and I noticed that my battery voltage was getting quite low at this point. We had decided to run a thicker weight oil, ended up being definitely not in the favor of uh, keeping the oil temps down. So I get back to the bottom of the hill and the guys are now rushing at changing the oil. I want to change the alternator as well because it was definitely low on voltage. They're rushing to get the car back together. With only one run left in the day, the stewards basically come up and ask if we're running. I'm like, if we can get to everything together, we're gonna run this last run. We show up right at the start line and we're the last car on the grid. And they're like, you know what, go. Adrenaline's pumping at this point in time. Just drive as hard as we possibly can. This is the first time where I think everything's ready to go. I just start attacking, driving really, really good. Really confident with the car, really confident with the line. Ended up crossing the checkered flag line with a 409, I believe it was, which was definitely my personal best at that time. I want to say it was about eight or nine seconds faster than my qualifying time. FanFest was on that night. You know, let's clean up. Let's clean up me, fresh hairdo by Art. This is marketing 101 right here. That was a great time, you know, having 20,000 people from Colorado Springs come out and meet and greet and be able to hand out some Beast Energy cookies. We had a vibrant HD clamp beanbag toss going on. A lot of uh, people came by and taught, you know, I gave, gave it a shot and won some cool prizes. So that was pretty exciting. And then instantly a storm came out of nowhere. They were like, yeah, that's it, pack up. What, what an experience, a lot of fun. Came Saturday and Saturday was basically get the car ready for race day. We decided we would quickly do some duct work for the oil cooler. We added a water sprayer directly to the oil cooler. load up, get over to Pikes Peak pits and load in the car. You know, this buildup of all week where it's been waking up at 2.30 in the morning, getting to the track, running from 5.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m., packing up in a hurry, get off the hill by 9 a.m., pretty much every day working on the car till 10 or 11 p.m. And then you get to Saturday and it's like, hold on, um, we're not unloading till 2 p.m. After a good night's rest, we get to Early morning, I think we arrived to the track at around 4.30 a.m. And here we are projecting that, hey, look, we think we can do a, about an 11 a.m. projected time, which is just about perfect for the weather. But sure enough, you know, 9.30 rolls around and the bikes haven't even finished their runs yet. We get to the start line at this point in time, or it's around 1 p.m. The course marshal was like, they spotted rain in a few spots. We have slicks on, are the slicks okay? He's like, yeah, you'll be okay. Green flag raves, launch control on and I launch amazingly off the line. Go through the first lower portion of the mountain and the car felt great. I was driving really well. I was just managing temperatures, short shifting whenever I could just so that way we didn't build excessive oil temperatures. The car was really, really working well. And we get to Glen Cove, so into the beginning of the middle sector. Sure enough, I see a little bit of water on my windshield. Nothing too bad. So we get to the first of the fast right-handers going into the upper switchbacks or the W's as they call them. It's a really, really high-speed right-hander. In practice, I went through at 180 kilometers an hour while lifting. But at this point in time and moment, I saw quite a lot of water on my window. Enough that I was like very hesitant to push it on slicks, not quite sure what the grip levels were, not quite sure how the track responds to water. You know, being a public road, you don't know what to expect. I take it a little bit easier there. We get to the hairpin at brake hard. Sure enough, there was actually still a reasonable amount of grip. I finish off that section and get to Devil's Playground. Again, the car's just working amazingly and I had my temperatures well in check at this point. You know, it went from 135 degrees and it actually started dropping down to 132. And I knew like I could push a little harder and I could push a little, get a little more out of that engine. You know, with the higher speed sections of the upper mountain, you also get more um, cooling just from the higher speeds available. So we get to basically bottomless pit. This was probably the toughest part that I had during practice time. I knew exactly where my good braking points would be and how to get through these sections. And I took those next few lefts just amazingly well. And here we are getting into basically the home stretch, which is going through Boulder Park. And then you have this long, long straightaway that gets into Cog Cut. And as I'm going into Boulder Park, I, I'm shifting into second gear and I lost all drive. And I shift to third, shift to fourth, shift to fifth. No drive whatsoever, the car's not moving anywhere, it's just free revving. So I'm like, that's it, that's, it's broken. 
get off the, the road just make sure that I don't block anybody else go down the gears five four three two hit first gear and as I'm letting out the clutch the car chugs a little I'm like whoa that's interesting so I get back on throttle and it would move so I get back onto the course went through the gears again nothing went back down the first and the first gear is working again I remember what our very first goal was, and that was to make it to the summit of Pikes Peak. You know what, I'm not gonna give up. I'm gonna just drive the rest of it in first gear, and that's what I did. I finished the last mile and a half in first gear. Crossed the finish line, got the checkered flag. Honestly, probably the greatest sense of accomplishment. Just unbelievable, the pressure internally just let off at that point in time, and it was just such a relief to see that, make it over, and actually parked the car at the summit of Pikes Peak. Sat in the car for a good minute, just reflecting on what just happened. Not realizing just how crazy and how unreal this event is. Part disappointment that, you know, we were doing so well up until that point, had the front wheel drive record uh, in our sights. You know, you realize after the event how few people finish at the summit of Pikes Peak this year. You're climbing 4,000 feet vertically, running 12.42 miles of the course. It is absolutely the heaviest abuse you could ever put on a race car. I get out of the car and that was it, you know? Yes, made it, got to the top. I don't think many people could understand just how amazing that felt at that point in time. We ended up finishing the course in just over 11 minutes. Afterwards, you know, you're looking at your sector times and basically through the first three sectors, we were almost 40 seconds ahead of the front wheel drive record. We get back and we ended up earning ourselves a third place in the unlimited class. Brought home this nice piece of hardware. Definitely something that'll go in the trophy case. And... But now's the challenge of going back and actually taking the record. Definitely won't be our last time at Pikes Peak. We'll definitely be back there, take the lessons we learned and go after it again.